Um, our guest today is Jill Denner. She is a senior research associate at uh, Education and Training Research Associates, which is a nonprofit organization in California. Um, Jill Denner earned her PhD in developmental psychology, and she studies gender equity with a focus on Latinas. Um, she also works in partnership with um, youth, schools, community organizations, um, and she is the co-founder of the Girl Game Honey. Uh, the Girl Game Company, which is a program for Latina girls based in Watsonville, California. Um, she co-founded this along with Steve Bean and Jacob Martinez, who will also be presenting today. In addition, um, Jill has authored several books. The latest one, she is a co-editor and contributor to Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, New Perspectives on Gender and Gaming. So please welcome Jill Denner. First, thank our sponsors here at Google, the Google Women Engineers, the Hispanic Engineering Network, and the Diversity Program for inviting us to come here and talk about gender and gaming today. There may be a few of you out there wondering why do we want to focus on girls and gaming? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today in the, in the talk. I'm also going to be talking, like Raquel said, about our new book called Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat. Here it is, if you haven't seen it. And I'm also going to be talking about the Girl Game Company. And I have a couple of colleagues here, Jacob Martinez and Steve Bean, who will be helping me tell you about the Girl Game Company today. So that's an overview of what we'll be doing in the next 45 minutes or so. I want to give a disclaimer in the very beginning of this talk. I want to say right up front, I don't consider myself a gamer. I sure played a lot of games in the early 80s. Uh, this Pac-Man and Centipede were my favorite, and the heyday of the arcade games. Today, I play games mostly from a research perspective. I'm really interested in the way that um, gaming can engage women and girls, particularly minority girls, in uh, computing and information sciences. And so I want to put that right there in the front. Why would I be interested in engaging women and girls in computing and information sciences? Probably a lot of you know these statistics. I'll run through them really quickly. Over the last 25 years, there's been a decline in the number of people getting um, CIS degrees, in particular the number of women. This graph breaks it down by type of advanced degree. The sharpest decline, as you can see, is in associate's degrees. There's been a slight increase in PhD degrees. But if you take a look at who are getting these doctoral degrees among women, 48% uh, of them who have earned these degrees in the U.S. in 2004 were not U.S. citizens. So the expectation is they're not people who are going to stay and going to be feeding into the workforce. 36% were white. And I want you to pay particular attention to a very small slice at the bottom, the 1.5% who are Hispanic and female. The situation is very similar if we look at the, um, the computing workforce. 29% of computing scientists in 2004 were female, 4% were, were um, African American and female, 2% female and Asian, and 1% female and Hispanic Latino. I'm going to show you another graph that shows a kind of a different trend. These are revenues from the United States video game industry over the last 12 years. In contrast to the CIS degrees, these numbers are going up exponentially. This is a booming industry, but as you know, the growth in the gaming industry has not necessarily led to an increase in the numbers of people who are choosing to, measure, to major in CIS, especially among women. So what are the kind of factors that lead women to pursue computing? Well, there's, a, there's some research out there that gives us some indication. Family expectations are one factor that plays a long-term role. Positive role models, um, prior computing access and experience, and the last one, which is most relevant to the talk today, prior gaming experience. Some research by Jay Margolis and Alan Fisher um, in the early part of this decade focused on undergraduates in, compu in computer science, and they really pointed to gaming and gaming experiences as a factor that led to them wanting to pursue those majors. So the question I'm going to raise today is, can gaming get help get women on the path to computing? And I'm going to make the argument that, yeah, I think it can. It has the potential. And I'm going to make that argument by sharing some of the chapters from the book, as well as talking to you about the Girl Game Company, which is our effort to try and get girls interested in computing by engaging them in game design and game programming. So before I can talk about this new book from Beyond Barbie, I need to give you a little bit of history. Ten years ago, 
this book came out. Some of you may have seen it. It was called From Barbie to Mortal Kombat. It was published in 1998 by MIT Press. And this was kind of a, a response to a groundswell of interest in efforts to get more women involved in gaming. At the time, there were several myths floating around. One of the myths was that women and girls were not interested in gaming. There was no point. Another myth was that um, research on game design and gameplay wasn't a valid field of study. And finally, the, the last myth was that in order to get girls and women interested in gaming, we had to make games specifically for girls. So this book talked a lot about that effort to make games for girls specifically. And there was debate about the best way to reach a female audience. In the girl game movement, there were those who thought we needed pink games, and there were those who we thought we needed purple games. Pink games, um, here's a classic example. Barbie Fashion Designer was a game that came out um, designed for girls. And what you could do is you could make um, dresses and other clothes on your computer and print them out on special fabric and actually dress up your Barbie doll with them. A purple game, this is an example of a game by the company Purple Moon that was founded by Brenda Laurel. And she had a series of games that focused on this girl named Rocket. And these games were designed to embrace more complex roles for, for females and address some of the issues that girls are supposedly interested in, like friendships and telling secrets. So in these games, Rocket has to negotiate different relationships at her school. So one of the people who contributed to this From Barbie to Mortal Kombat book was named Yasmin Kafai. And uh, I met her at a conference in 2005, the Digital Games Research Association conference. And she and Carrie Heater and I got together and we said, what's happened since that book came out? Has anything changed at all? Gaming has really moved from the margins to the mainstream. What implications has that had? And those conversations led to the publication of our book, um, Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, in 2008. So it just came out in September of last year, also published by MIT Press. The book has five different sections, and I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. For those of you in the room here, there's a handout at the back table that details the chapters. And you can also go online to MIT Press and look at the chapters and read some samples. The first part of the book focuses on reflections. And there's three different chapters in this section. The people who wrote them were all contributors to the original volume 10 years ago. And they spend time talking about, from their perspective, what's happened, what's changed, and what has not changed in the 10 years. <coughs> The second section focuses on girls and women as players. So these are chapters that focus on gaming, women gaming, in different parts of the world, in Taiwan, in Japan, in the United States. What happens when women play? What does it look like? How do they get access? And what are the barriers? The third section focuses on girls and women in the role of game designers, both children and adult women, and what are some of the barriers to getting women into the gaming industry. The fourth section focuses on changing girls and changing games. And this is really a collection of chapters that focus on what people call serious games. Um, games that are educational, games for the classroom, games that are just designed to teach something, activist games, etc. And then there's a, a final section of our book which focuses on industry voices. And these are interviews with female representatives from the gaming industry talking about their perspectives on, on what the situation is today. It's a long book. It's an edited book. I'm not going to talk about every chapter today, obviously. Instead, I'm going to address two broad questions that the book is designed to raise. One of the questions is, what happened to the girl game movement, the pink and purple games? The other question is, is it still important to talk about gender and gaming? And so first, the, what happened to the girl game movement? These are screenshots from two um, current games. Actually, the one on the left hasn't even been released yet. Last summer, Paramount Pictures um, announced that they were going to do a series of games on some of their more popular girl movies, Mean Girls, Pretty in Pink, and Clueless. And on the left is a screenshot from the Clueless game. I'm going to read you a description from their press release about what this game will be about. The player takes on the part of Cher, trying to find the perfect boyfriends for all her pals. Players will need to figure out what kind of guy their friends want by noticing what clothes these potential suitors wear and what sort of interests they have. Once Cher knows what they want, she will have to pick out the right elements to make the perfect man for them. Players will have to be quick. Love waits for no one. On the right, you see um, 
you see Barbie fashion show, that's more of an updated version from the Barbie series. So obviously there's still a market for pink games, but they're definitely not the most popular games out there. There's also a market for purple games. Her Interactive is a company that's been around for over a decade. They're known for making um, games based on the character of Nancy Drew. And uh, there's actually an interview with Megan Geyser, the CEO, in our book. Um, she talks about what she thinks has made her company successful. And one of the factors is that um, they have a second chance feature. So in many popular games, basically if you get, if you get killed, that's it. Or if what you're doing fails, um, you're done and you have to start over. They've incorporated a second chance feature, which they say appeals to girls. Allows them to basically start over from where they made their, their fatal mistake. So purple games, pink games, they're still out there. Um, but like I said, they're not the most popular. They're not capturing the market. So what are the most popular games? I want to ask the people in the audience here to just raise their hand if they've played a digital game, any kind of game, a console game, an online game, a casual game. Played a game in the last week. Ooh, about a half of you. Okay. How many of you played The Sims? Yeah. Only a couple. How many of you played a first-person shooter game? A few people. How about Mario Kart? Yeah. Good. So we got it. Good. Thank you for being honest. So, <coughs> Sims and Mario Kart are two of the most popular games out there still today. Some of the best sellers <coughs> certainly over the, the past decade. Sales of the Sims game series have recently topped 100 million units in the last eight years. It makes it the most popular PC game series ever. Um, these are also both games that appeal in great numbers to women as well as to men. And part of the reason is that they embrace a lot of the characters, characteristics of the girl game movement without saying these are games for girls. These are games for lots of people. They allow for a range of play styles. In particular, most of the popular games share many characteristics of the pink and purple games without being pink or purple. So you can start playing right away. There's not a sharp learning curve. Um, the player can determine the speed in a lot of cases. Many emphasize stories and characters. Um, they're everyday people that players can relate to. And often winning is linked to something besides dominating or killing. It's linked to social networking. Casual games are also a new phenomenon in the last 10 years and also very, very popular among women. The data suggests that 75% of people who pay for casual games are women and 72% of these players, these female players, are over the age of 35. This is a very different demographic than the, the male teens that were playing in great numbers 10 years ago. Casual games, for those of you who don't know, are these really quick to learn, quick to finish games. Bejeweled being one of the more popular ones. Diner Dash, also a very popular one. You have to take on the character of Flo, start your own restaurant, wait on people, juggle demands, people waiting in line, getting paid, and earning points. So this is what women are playing. What are they not playing? First person shooter games. Much less, of course, there's exceptions. Some women are playing these games, but to a great extent, these are appealing to a male audience. These are shots from Call of Duty. They're also less likely to be playing the massively multiplayer online games. Um, these are two screenshots from World of Warcraft. This was the most popular MMO in 2008. They claim they had over 11 million registered players. And so I've been talking really about what women and men are playing, some of the gender differences. But I really want to make the point today that what we want to do is move beyond these dichotomies of asking what are men playing, what are women playing, and asking questions about why are they playing, who are they playing with, and how are they playing. So this new book, Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, really aims to shift the conversation beyond these dichotomies to asking about the social context of gaming and what are the motivations for getting involved. One of the chapters in the book that I'm going to talk about is by a man named Nick Yee, and he actually surveyed 40,000 players of MMOs, so people who play EverQuest and World of Warcraft and some of the more popular massive multiplayer online games. And he asked them what motivated them to play. 85% of his respondents were male, and um, the average age was 26 years. And what he found was that the women, on average, were older than the men. And he came up with what I think is a pretty useful um, 
table that describes the broad, three broad categories of motivation for playing these types of games. They focus on achievement, on social issues, and on immersion. And what he did was he took a look to see whether there were gender differences in motivation for play. And he found there were some gender differences. One, in particular, men were more likely to cite achievement as a goal for them. And women were more likely to talk about relationships or customization as a motivation for playing these online games. But what he found was that age was a better predictor than gender was. And that when, even though there were gender differences in some cases, there was more overlap than there was difference. So again, trying to shift the conversation from the differences to, at least among those who play these games, motivations being somewhat different, but more similar than different. Obviously, um, he was only asking people who are playing what their motivations were. So what about the women who are not playing? What are the factors that keep them from getting involved? And the players had some theories about that. They said that it was the game culture rather than the game mechanics that kept them from getting involved. It wasn't that the game was too hard. It was that the game, the social interactions and the culture, the responses they got when they went out there with a female avatar um, were the kind of things that dissuaded them from participating in these games. So what kinds of gaming environments do attract women? Wyville is one in particular. How many people have heard of Wyville? This is a great online educational site for teens. And um, here's the link, wyville.net. Yasmin Kafayi wrote a chapter um, of her research studying what happened when girls and boys were in a community center playing on Wildville. And there's games, there's chat, um, there's opportunities to earn virtual money. And she found also that boys and girls were interacting in the site and interacting online so that the boundaries between the physical and the virtual were blurring. She found that in this in this virtual world, gaming was a social activity. So if you can just, just look at the difference visually, how Wyville looks compared to what something like World of Warcraft looks, and also how the interactions are happening there. So again, focus on the social, the social context of gaming rather than just what they're playing. So, let me go back to Wyville for a second. So what happened to the girl game movement? Well, pink and purple games still exist. They're still out there, they're still a market. But it's not, they're not the most popular. Other gaming experiences have captured the attention of women and girls, Wyville being one. Social networking sites, user-generated content, and short, <coughs> easy-to-learn games are the ones that have brought women into gaming. So here are some statistics from the entertainment software industry. Um, these stats say that 40% of all game players are women, and they're combining all sorts of games, console games, casual games, online games. Women over the age of 18 are representing a good chunk of those playing games. In fact, they represent a larger chunk than boys on age 17 or younger. And so some people take this information and they say, well, women are playing. Why are we still talking about gender? Why is gender still important? And some of the chapters in our book um, argue that it is still important, that men and women are playing different games, but they're also having different experiences when they play, even if they're playing the same games. And, and these different experiences learn to different kinds of learning. There's also still gender stereotypes that are limiting their, gaming, limiting their gaming experiences, and there are very few games out there that reward a range of play styles. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And finally, men still far outnumber women in the gaming industry. So the chapter suggests that we need to keep gender in focus, not because we need more games for girls, but because we just need better games out there. Nicole Lazaro in her chapter says that the very best games, those that appeal to a broad range of players, are those that incorporate what she calls the four fun keys. Hard fun is opportunities for mastery. Easy fun are aspects of a game that inspire curiosity. Serious fun are opportunities to learn. And people fun are opportunities to interact with other people and hang out with friends. Terry Heater and Brian Wynn talk about a game called Life Preservers, and they incorporate some aspects of these four fun keys. This is an educational game that's focused on evolution. It's designed to meet national science standards. And what they did was incorporate a range of play styles, so rewarding exploration rather than just speed. So people get points for finding things out and spending some time rather than just getting to the end of the game. And in their chapter, they, they did a study to see um, whether these play styles vary by men and women, by boys and girls who are playing the games. 
So why do so few games reward a range of play styles? One of the reasons is that women and girls are not involved in making games to the extent that they could be. There are a couple of chapters in the book that focus on um, why is this, what's preventing women from staying, getting in and staying in the gaming industry. One is a male-dominated culture of game playing and making, a work environment that focuses on limited game contact and, and play style, particularly the game content that men tend to be more drawn to, and also crunch times, intense periods right before a game needs to be finished that prevents some people from going home for long periods of time. And that's particularly a disincentive for women if they're primary caregivers in the family. So these chapters, one by Mia Consalvo and one by Tracy Fullerton and her colleagues, talk about this issue and, and also talk about some of the strategies that we can use to overcome some of these barriers. In particular, student internships, linking people to role models, offering game design workshops led by women or strategies that they offer. So when women are not involved in making games, not only does it limit the kinds of gaming experiences that we all get to experience, it limits the opportunities for women, for women to get what Betty Hayes in her chapter calls, to get on these trajectories to IT expertise, basically to get women on the pathway to computing fields. She argues that we need to get more girls and women involved in productive gaming experiences, not just playing games, but really changing the games that they're involved with in order to build the kind of skills that they need to help fill this gap in the in the computing workforce. The chapter that I wrote for the book um, focuses on a program we were running for girls. We had 126 girls in an after-school program making games, um, designing them and programming themselves. And in this case, they were using um, software, Flash MX. This was a number of years ago. I was interested in whether game design and programming could get girls interested in computing to computing fields, and also I was interested in what kind of games would they make? Would they look anything like the most popular games out there? And in the chapter I wrote with my colleague Shannon Campy, we found that in fact the games were a little bit different than the kind we see out there. One factor that stood out a lot was many of them focused on humor. To a great extent they focused on real life issues. They also focused on moral issues that were very real to the girls. And not only did they endorse gender stereotypes, but many of them actually were very playful and humorous with gender stereotypes. I'm going to show you some examples from a few of these games. This game is called The Story of Mr. Kaboom. This is actually an animated sequence. And in this sequence, uh, Mr. Kaboom is throwing a pie at Ms. Boom because she has denied him. He's asked her to marry him, and she has said no. The Bad Babysitter is the story of Kevin. Kevin's the babysitter in this case. And he's having a moral dilemma. He's invited his girlfriend over, and he can't decide whether they should go to the mall or whether he should stay and take care of the child and make some food. And actually, he stays, if he stays and makes the food, he ends up setting the kitchen on fire. So he's in a, he's in a bad situation. Then. The Who Is Your Dream Date game is a pink game. It reminds me a little of what the Clueless game might look like. We'll see when that comes out, in which the player has to decide um, which boy they want to go on a date. So we, we did some research with this um, group of girls to find out what they were getting out of making games, not just what games they made. And um, we found that there was an increase in their computer skills. This was compared to a group of girls who didn't do any game design or programming. An increase in their knowledge about computing. Increase in their perception that there was social support for them to, to pursue um, computing classes. And a decrease in their stereotypes, their negative stereotypes about girls and computers. And, people who work in the field of information technology. I have a link to the website where you can read more about this work and play all the games that the girls made. This research was actually completed three years ago, and um, in a minute I'm going to have my colleague Steve Bean come up here and talk about how we've taken this work to a new level with a new program called the Girl Game Company. But first I'm just going to give you a summary of the book. So, Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, there's a lot in the book, obviously couldn't cover it all. But the general overview is that we, we need to focus, in order to get women and girls engaged in computing, in gaming, we need to focus on why, how, and with whom women and girls are playing, not just on what they're playing. Games must begin to offer more of a range of gaming experiences, and we need to get more women and girls involved in making games at every level. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Steve B. I'm going to tell you about the Girl Game Company.
Thanks, I'm Steve Bean. I'm the director of the Center for Youth Success at ETR Associates. And Jill and I are co-directors of the Girl Game Company project. So this is our way of trying to increase that little sliver of 1.5% of CIS degrees going to Latinas in this country. And this is how we're trying to apply some of the things that we learned in girls creating games and some of the things that Jill talked about in the book. Um, for those of you who are interested, there's some handouts about Girl Game Company in the back on that table, so please take one on your way out if you'd like one. And um, we're doing this as an intensive after-school program in Watsonville, California. So this is at the southern end of Santa Cruz County. Two of the chapters in Jill's book discusses how one of the ways that researchers have found that gaming is a gateway to computing and computer science is through the ability for gamers to either create user-generated content or to modify, to mod their games. Well, when we started thinking about ways we would try and get Latina girls involved in computing, we thought they like to play games. Everything Jill just told you shows women are playing games now in unprecedented numbers. So let's just try to see what happens if we skip over the modding and the user-generated content and go straight to having them design and produce their own original games. So um, here you see the goals that we had for our program to encourage girls' computing interests, to increase their skills, to help them pursue the higher education that anyone is going to need to go into these industries, and then keep them, keep those paths open to them. We're not necessarily saying that we want every girl to be a computer scientist. But we want to make sure they don't do the things in their academic careers that would keep them from being able to choose that if they wanted to. So the Girl Game Company is funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation, a grant funding stream called Innovative Technology Experiences for Students and Teachers. And um, Girl Game Company girls meet twice a week after school. We operate at two middle schools for 90 minutes at a time. And then in the summer, they're there almost all day, about six hours a day for either two or three week summer intensive, depending on how far they are along in the program. So the program is 16 months long. They start in um, an academic year, they span over to the next academic year, and they have two summer intensives during that time. So it's a, it's a large commitment for them, and it's a very intensive experience. So we're about two thirds of the way through our second cohort, our second groups of, group of girls going through this 16 month program. And to date, we've had almost 100 girls participate in the program at some level. Not all of those 100 girls have finished, um, completed 16 months, but all of them have participated at some level. So who are the girls who joined Girl Game Company? Well, what I want you to understand is that these are not the computer whiz kids you might normally imagine being in programs of this sort. Um, Tell you a little bit about Watsonville to help you understand. Watsonville's got 50,000 people, um, but it's surrounded by agriculture, about 55,000 acres of agriculture in and around Watsonville, California. More than 75% of Watsonville residents are Latino, and most of those are Mexican origin immigrants or migrants. Um, as of 2000, the per capita income in Watsonville was a little over $13,000. So compare that to Santa Clara County where the, capa the per capita income is almost $33,000. You can see the difference. And then over 50% of Watsonville residents do not have a high school diploma. So what does that mean for our girls? Well, they're predominantly Latina. They're not all Latina, but most of them are. For many of them, English is their second language. And computing is actually a great way for them to be involved in an activity that isn't necessarily language dependent, but can help them develop their language, language skills. That's ironic. Um, you may have heard about the digital divide, and you may have heard about it going away. And like a lot of problems in the country, it's gone away for some people and not for others. And our girls are coming from households where the digital divide is often still very alive and well. They may not have a computer at home. Um, they may have parents who are unfamiliar with information technology and computing. So for some of them, this is their real, really their only opportunity to work on computers. Um, College-bound question mark. Many of our girls come from households where they're going to be the first person in their family to go to college. If they go to college, and they may be the first person in their family to receive a high school diploma. Um, 
coming from Latino families, they're often dealing with gender role expectations about what's appropriate and what's expected of girls that's different from what's appropriate and expected from boys. And then, um, because they live in that digital divide, they often don't have any computing skills to speak of. We were a little surprised ourselves to find that when we first started working with some of our girls, they didn't know how to turn a computer on. They didn't know what a mouse was. They didn't really know how to operate the keyboard. And then, you can imagine how that translates into very little awareness that there are careers out there that use computers that they could get into. But these are exactly the youth that we want to reach to increase that 1.5%. And so this is what we do to try and reach them. These are the five elements of the Girl Game Company program. So we try and build a sense of group and a sense of identity. That is, a sense of identity that says, I can do computers and I can do other things. And those are not, those are, those are compatible those are compatible identities. Those don't have to be in conflict with each other. We have them do recreational and exploration activities on computers, and Jill mentioned Wyville. It's a popular one with our girls. And then um, the big part of the program is them building their own original computer games. They do those in, and do that in pairs. And then we bring them on industry and college university field trips. They've, our girls have actually been here to Google, thank you very much, for four times now, Jacob? Four times. So. We appreciate you hosting them. And then finally, the last piece is family involvement. We have a parent workshop series and a parent involvement piece because research shows that's a critical part of getting underrepresented groups involved in any field in which they're underrepresented, is having families that are supportive of them taking that direction. So the way we try and make the program work especially well for girls uh, are, is up here on this slide. First of all, it's girls only. Secondly, we don't mark it as a techie program. This is, not, this is not a program to make them computer geeks. The way we try and market the program is that they're going to get to be with friends, be with people they like, do things that they're going to enjoy, make games that are going to be enjoyable for them to make, but that these are things that they want to do for fun and because they're interesting, not because they're going to become brilliant IT people. We really try and make our program work in terms of what we know about adolescent development and identity formation. And there are a number of things we do around that. Mostly what I spoke about a moment ago is really trying hard to make sure that girls don't feel like they have to choose between identities. These are young people who are interested in computers, they're also interested in drama, they're also interested in sports and they're also interested in dating, and they're all also interested in their family. And we try and create a program where none of those things conflict with each other. We try and give them a lot of support to do that, both in terms of the social experience and the technological experience. So um, they work in pairs, in what we call pair programming, where two people work on one computer, so they have a built-in helper. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that creates conflict. But generally, our girls, the majority of our girls like working with a partner. We also, rather than rescuing them, coming up to them and solving their problems for them, we really try and teach them to become independent problem solvers and to rely on each other. So we have a lot of peer help going on in our program, and we actually have veterans coming back from previous cohorts who are helping in the, in the program as peer helpers, and that's their whole job. So the girls who are new are seeing girls who finish the program helping with the technical expertise. And then finally, we have um, role models and mentors from the community and from industry. And I know we have at least one role model mentor from Google here in the audience. Could I actually have any of the role models or mentors for our program who are here today raise their hands? Raquel is our only one. Raquel, do you want to say anything about your experience sure. as a role model? Um, thanks. I won't take too much time, but I just, uh, for any computer scientist or, or software engineer, you know that learning or just falling in love with the idea of solving problems computationally, you have to actually do it. You can't just read about it. And usually the way you learned when you were, whatever, 10, I don't know, people like Google, we started pretty early. Um, someone was there. You had a, a friend or a relative or a sibling who kind of like got you interested. So. Um, I think this program is a real beacon of hope because, and I'm really looking forward to what it's doing next because um, 
a lot of these girls just don't have someone like that around the house that can get them hooked and addicted to it that a lot of us have. So um, that's why I'm a mentor, and I think that, that our future plans to get like the technical mentorship part of it even stronger, so that um, you're not just a role model, but you maybe are actually working on something with them it has a lot of potential to really get get girls. Um, who would be hooked if they had just the right kind of exposure, which is not, does not mean just put them in a computer lab, but actually get them get working on something that you'd love to do and don't want to stop working on. So, um, thanks for So I'm going to turn the mic over to Jacob, who's going to be your last presenter. Jacob is the guy who's there every day working with the girls in the field. And so we thought it would be good for you to see the kinds of games the girls are building and also hear about a couple of girls' lives and how, how they um, build games in the program. But I want to leave you with um, kind of one strong sense of our program, which is uh, I like to think of it as Girl Game Companies for these girls is a program of firsts. So this is probably the first time they've completed any kind of a project that involves using a computer as a tool. It's the first time they've ever completed a project on a computer and then shown it to other people. So our girls are publishing their games on Wyville and having their peers who are playing in Wyville come and play their games and give them feedback. It's the first time they've ever visited a computer company like Google and seen people who actually work there, much less people who look like them. And then, it's for many of these girls the first time they've ever been on a college or a university campus. And finally, it's maybe the first time in their middle school career, they may have graduated from elementary school, but it's the first time in their middle school career that they've graduated from anything, that they're getting kudos, they're getting um, affirmations for finishing a program. And so for them, it's really a unique experience. But I'm going to let Jacob really kind of give you a, a window to what they're like and what their games are like. So as Steve uh, mentioned, I'm the project coordinator for the program. Everybody probably recognizes this photo. This is taken here, and of course, this is one of the most memorable thing about the trip was the nachos. <laughs> That's, I think, our last visit here at Google. So I'm, I'm going to um, describe two different girls in the program. One was a recent graduate of the program from our first cohort, and one who's currently in the program. And I'm also going to show their games. Um, the first girl is Christina. She is currently in the program. She's the seventh grader. She is one of those girls that came into the program with very low tech skills, to the point where she had to write in my email into the sign up for Wyville. And she didn't know how to use two hands on the keyboard and pull down the shift and hit the number two for the at symbol. Um, she was also struggling with the mouse, navigating a mouse around a computer screen. And you know, she was a seventh grader. Um, and that's where she was at entering the program. The second girl, Sophia, she is currently a freshman in high school. Uh, she comes from a single parent household. Her younger sister was in the program as well. And um, when she came in, she had no email. She had um, very low exposure to technology. And she just entered um, high school. And the, first, the, the night before the first day of school, I get an email from her telling me she's nervous, she's scared, and she doesn't know what to do. And she's nervous, all nervous about starting high school the next day. And um, so just the opportunity for her to do that, to reach out through email to somebody there, to somebody, um, was a big step for her. So the software that we use is a lot different from the previous screenshots you saw. Um, it's called Stagecast Creator. It's very 2D. Um, it kind of reminds me of Pac-Man, or you can make games like Asteroids. Um, but some of the genres of games we've had to make are maze games, um, where you try to navigate through a maze, action games, um, and we're currently, the girls are making quiz games which is um, they're putting content, just asking trivia questions. And one of the challenges that we've had um, is actually how do you get girls to incorporate content into their games? Um, that's a challenge that we're every day trying to get the girls to do. And um, with these quiz games is the first sign. Uh, we see a lot of the, a lot of the content um, in some of the games. So like I said, the first, well, one, one of the first games they had, they had the girls make was a maze game. And each of the games in StageCast has some of the same um, features where you have a player character, which is this yellow square in the bottom right hand corner. And the goal is to always try to get to the next stage or next level through a door, which you see in the upper left hand corner. Um, so prior to this screen, there was an introduction page with directions on how to play the game, with a little backstory about the game. And then you walk to the door and it brings you to the first player stage. 
And you see some of these other characters around here. Um, there's a little like blue fish in the middle there, a jellyfish in the bottom. Those are like the villains where you're trying to avoid these villains and navigate your way through this maze to the door. So this was the one, um, this was actually one of Sophia's games. I'm sorry, I've seen these games. Um, and so this is the second game that she made. So you can see how now she's drawing a lot of her original art. She's putting a lot more color into her games. Um, you are now this character in the middle of the screen um, with red dress, blonde hair, and you're trying to navigate through to the door again, um, trying to avoid these, what she calls killer flowers. But um, again, all this is her original art, which she drew within this program. Now this is her last game that she's um, built, and this is one of my favorite games, where you're a farmer and you're trying to hit these pigs and you're turning them into bacon. And so the, the feature that she added in here is a scorekeeper. So you're not allowed to proceed to the next level until you reach a certain score. So that was um, a new skill that she learned and she incorporated into this game. So you, can just, you can't just simply walk through the door, you actually have to hit these pigs. And the other levels are actually trying to hit the cows and turn them into hamburgers. Um, so this was um, Christina's game. This is the one girl who was from Sophia's game. The girl from a single parent household. This was um, her first maze game. You're this astronaut upper um, left hand corner and trying to get through the door um, and avoid these, the villains. And now she, this is her second game where you're um, navigating to different stages and you're with a scientist and you're trying to save the hippos from extinction and you have to get to this swamp. And the way that she drew, if you're playing it, you're actually, both characters are actually in the boat. If you get hit by the wave, it causes the players to get knocked out of the boat and you have to click the reset button to start the game all over. And this was one of her last games, it's called Birds. Um, on the stage prior to this, you are the character and you're shooting the birds. And so once you pass that stage, you are now the player character on the upper loop left that man and you're not trying to dodge the birds or gain the revenge on you for hitting their um, fellow birds and trying to get through the door. So that was just a sample of the games. Um, Steve and Joe both mentioned Wyville. And you can actually, this is our girl game company clubhouse. So within Wyville there's all these different clubhouses um, with different activities. We actually have our own clubhouse where you click on the game console and you can actually go in there and you can play some of the girls' games. Um, many of the games that you saw, they were currently being uploaded onto the site. Um, so there'll be some new games up there by the end of this week. And I'll just pass it back to Jill. So you got to see some of the games and hear about some of the girls. And I'll just tell you briefly about some of the research we're doing. Um, obviously, we're interested in what the girls like about the girl game company, what keeps them coming back. Um, they tell us they like opportunities to be creative. They like opportunities to build games, and not just to build games, but to put them somewhere that other people can play them, like on live. And of course, they like being with and making new friends. Steve mentioned that they make their games with a partner, and the collaborative aspect is a real draw for them. We're still in the middle of analyzing our data for um, the Girl Game Company girls, but for our first 24 girls who completed the program, we did find that they increased their computer usage, their skills, their confidence. We increased their intention to use and study computing. We also increased their perception of having family support to pursue college as well as to pursue a more technical career. So these are promising findings, and as our next group of girls graduates in the summer, We'll have even more data to look at. We're also analyzing the games for aspects of computational thinking because there's a lot of complex programming that goes into these games. It's kind of, it's somewhat hard to see and, and you can go behind the scenes, but when Jacob showed you the progression of games each girl was making, we're going to take a look at whether they get more technical over time and what the implications of that for how girls are thinking about computing. So the, the, the work we have been doing has been funded by the National Science Foundation, and that's our major funding, and that is ending in September. Um, we are applying for more funding. We have a, a grant under review here at Google through the RISE program, as well as some other potential funding. But we're trying to get more money from the National Science Foundation as well to build a true career pathway program in Watsonville. 
Right now we serve girls in middle school, and what we found is when they graduate, they want to continue doing more high-level computing, and their schools don't offer that to a great extent, or if they do, they don't feel welcome in those classrooms. So we're hoping to build a, a more of a wraparound program that involves families and goes, extends itself into high school. We're also going to bring boys in. There's obviously a need to get um, greater diversity in men in computing as well, so we'll be offering opportunities for girls as well as boys. We're also going to, going to be sharing our model and scaling up some of the things that we've learned. Some of you may be inspired by this. Um, if you're wondering if there's ways that you can help, there's plenty of ways you can help. Um, Raquel mentioned how her experience a little bit about being a role model. He's, um, we have many, many wonderful volunteers from Google who served as virtual mentors for our girls. And it's a pretty minimal um, time commitment. There's email exchanges, and when we come visit Google, if you're here, the girls love to meet the person. Um, we, again, appreciate Google hosting our girls here at the field trip. We just recently met with some of our girls who had graduated and had come to Google several times, and it was one of the most powerful experiences in the program. We also appreciate learning about other educational opportunities, because when our girls finish our program, like I said, there's not a lot to do for them. This is a picture, actually, of, of our girls here at Google showing um, one of the Google employees how to play one of their games. Um, other things you can do, get the word out, be our spokespersons, be our champions. Um, help us when we're writing for grants to sign on to written statements of support. Connect us with other potential new funders and donors. And if you want more information, um, Steve mentioned there is a brochure back here for those of you here in the audience. This is a website where you can play some of the games. You can go on Wyville and play some of our more recent games. If you're interested in um, research on gender and gaming, investigating.com is a fabulous site that brings together many, many, many articles from um, recent and past on gender and gaming. And if you want more information about the book, Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, um, there's actually, again, a flyer back here, or you can go to the MIT Press website. If you want to contact us for more information, we'd love to hear from you. Um, here at Google, Raquel has been our, our wonderful supporter, um, and two folks from the diversity program, Irene Ma and Jordan Bookie, are also people who know a little bit about our program. And I just want to say, you know, it's, it's with your help and support these kinds of programs exist, and I'm hoping that in the next book that comes out, the book will be all about the ways that we've increased diversity in computing, and we've also got a much broader <coughs> range of gaming experiences and game players. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I was fascinated. Um, I have a, a comment that leads into my question, which is that it's interesting to me that since you're dealing almost entirely with Latinas, that those little pictures that they draw of girls to be their heroes are, in every case that I saw, blonde. Um, and my question is, in your research in particular, and also in your experiences, are you seeing much of a difference between the interests and experiences of the minority girls and the non-minority girls. It's interesting what you point out, you call it the blonde, what they call the princess, and that's a popular choice. And one of the factors there is it's a limitation of the software. That was actually an existing character that they can use, and so a lot of them plunk that in. Those who draw their own characters, like the little farmer was drawn, they do have the opportunity to draw their own, and many do but they tend not to draw pictures of girls who look like themselves for some reason. And I don't have a good answer to, to the question of how it compares to other girls. This is a population that we've worked with um, predominantly. One of the things I'm interested in is what would look different for boys versus girls. But it's also a question that we've tried to ask them, getting them to reflect a bit on, on you know, their ethnic identity, their cultural identity. And it's a work in progress in trying to get them to think through some of those things. I don't have a good answer for you, though. But it's a, I think it's an important issue to raise, and it's interesting that that stood out for you. I just want to add to that. that one of the things that Jill's research shows with the Girls Creating Games program is that girls use game building as a way to explore new identities. And um, 
and do what she called transgression. So in a lot of those games, you see there's a lot of opportunities to break rules, like social rules, and see what the consequences are. And so I think your question may also get at some of the ways in which our girls are trying out different identities through, through creating different characters in their games. They may be identities that they'll ultimately accept or ultimately reject, but by building games, it's a safe place with no real consequences socially or otherwise for them to be people other than who they are. So I've heard that the, the Wii has a much broader appeal than most consoles. Can you talk about whether that's a significant impact? You know, it's funny because the Wii, you know, the, the, those game sales are through the roof, but as it turns out, right, when you buy the console, you get the Wii, so the, the data on, on who's actually playing that isn't really good. We know the girls in our program love the Wii, right? They've, they've actually brought that in and they've played that, um, so that's, that's engaged them. But I think the data is a little tricky there because we know that it's in the hands of a lot of people, but that's different data than who's actually playing it and how they're playing it. So maybe people have better data on that, be interested to. So you mentioned very briefly the, the hope of having these girls go on and get more computing uh, opportunities. And I was wondering if you figured out how you might cross the threshold of game programming, which is you know, very different than uh, programming in a programming language and stuff. Uh, that uh, can be a hard transition to cross. Sure. sure. I mean, I think one of the partnerships that we're developing now is um, with the University of California, Santa Cruz, and they have a, you know, in their engineering department, they have a game, computer game design major. And there's a place where the emphasis really is on computer science, but they're also doing gaming. And so it's a much more technical approach. And so we're not, we don't expect all our girls will go into more technical fields. I mean, right now, it looks like a third of them say, yeah, I really want a computing career. And they're in middle school, so that's, that's a pretty good statistic, I think, a third. And I think one potential strategy, which we're still working on, is to connect those, the most interested, with some of these people in the more technical fields and make the bridge in that, in that way. But you're right, it is a big leap. And another way to do it is we're also trying to show them that what they're doing is quite technical. I mean, some of them don't realize that they just made a game. They don't think that they've done anything that has any meaning in the world. And so bringing people in beyond just us, beyond people they see a lot, people like yourselves, people who are making games, telling them, hey, you did that? I do that. It looks like this when I do it. So we're still working on that bridge as our girls, our girls are just entering high school, some of them. So we're hoping to do more of that. But we welcome other suggestions of ways to make that bridge, because I think you make the good point. We weren't, we, we didn't have a, a way, a really good way to show you what building a game in Creator looks like, but it's all picture driven. So they, they can select a character out of a library and then go to a rules window and all the rule definition is done visually. So if I want the character to move one space to the right whenever, whenever the character has the opportunity to do that, then I put the character on this grid and I open the grid one space to the right and then I name my rule and it's done. So um, for the level of computing that these girls have, it's an exceptionally good software program to teach them the rudiments of programming and several of the fundamental aspects of programming they're picking up on, things like variables and iteration. What we don't know as much about that, that I would hope that we could start to learn in taking this program from the middle school into the high school level is how does uh, them learning on a program like that, on a piece of software like that, learn those fundamentals, how do we then translate that into them actually understanding more of the technical aspects of programming? Because as Jill said, right now I don't, I don't know how much they even realize they know about software development because so much of it's hidden uh, in the software program that they're using. Actually, I have one more question, if we have time. Um, have you guys thought about or tried to get uh, computer science students from UC Santa Cruz or nearby colleges to come and tutor so that their, I guess that some of their interactions aren't just with the teachers and also, ideally, I think the computer science students, although I don't know if there are any. Um, yeah, actually the games that we're, the girls are building now, we're going to enter them into a competition. 
um, that UC Santa Cruz, the Department, the Engineering Department, is actually going to host for us. So there is going to be an opportunity. Um, we hope to bring some of the graduate students down to Wattsville, which isn't too far away, to actually look at the games before the girls submit them and get some feedback and get some support around some of their design. Um, again, I mean that's that's our only resource in the community. Like I said, they're teachers that we have in the program are not computer science teachers, they're humanities, um, math teachers. So um, that is definitely what we wanna we wanna try to get more of. I would I would just add to that that we've had um, an effort to get teaching assistants from all ages, college up, up to adults, into the classroom, and I think had kind of a challenge getting them there. And frequently the teaching assistants we've been able to recruit are um, women who are interested in education, I think, more than they're interested in technology. So their drive is to be in the classroom helping young people. So if anybody has um, particularly good ideas about how we can get people who are both interested in teaching and interested in computer science to work with our girls, we'd love your ideas. Okay, I think we'll end there, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you.